Hi everyone, today's topic is understanding cable network RF return past signal levels and balancing. I'm Brady Volt, founder of The Volt Firm and Nimble This. Welcome back. With us today also is John Downey, Senior Tech CMTS Technical Leader at Cisco Systems. John, welcome back. Good to have you with us. Good to be back in this hot summertime. <laughs> We've had some hot days lately. Today we're going to be covering um, understanding cable network RF issues. I'm going to be playing uh, a new plant technician, and John's going to be my supervisor today, helping me understand what's going on. We had a great number of questions from technicians in the field, especially new technicians in the field coming in, trying to really understand what's going on in the upstream and the downstream. So I'm going to help understand, help lead us through this presentation, understanding, and John is going to be my supervisor. Last episode, we were talking about understanding and troubleshooting cable RF spectrum. During that episode, I mentioned that the final document was not yet complete editing by the SCTE. Now it is. It's been released. And if we get this slide up, I can show you what the document looks like to yourself and also a link to the document. You see that long link, HTTPS, www. It's posted on SCTE.org's website. And you don't have to do anything. It's a direct download if you hit that link. I also made a bit.ly short link. So if you go to HTTPS bit.ly slash SCTE underscore FBC, you can also take you directly to that link. And there's also a QR code. So if you just put your camera up to that QR code, that'll take you directly to the SCTE website where you can download understanding and troubleshooting cable RF spectrum. This is a fantastic document for anyone who wants to know more about full band capture, how to understand and interpret full band capture signals in the plant. Fantastic document. Put a little link uh, up in the video as well. Actually, I think it's up in this portion of the video screen and everyone will be able to access uh, last week's recording and also a link to the document itself. So moving right along, uh, we're going to start into so, we, so John, you know, as I mentioned, we get a lot of questions from our listeners about some of the basic fundamentals of how the upstream works, how splitters work, and I think it's important that we cover some of these basics. And that's why I said today I'm going to be a new technician coming into the field, and I, and I want you to help me guide me through some of these basic questions that we get in and, and understanding um, this upstream, basically upstream balancing and splitting, some of the, the basics that we go through every day. Our first question that will kind of help guide us comes from um, someone who calls himself Specimen 197. He writes, good morning, good evening. I'm a new maintenance technician in training for an ISP, and I was hoping I could ask you a question about return pass signal. If you'd kindly offer an explanation. I understand that the CMTS is what controls the modem's transmit power. Glad that you know he has he has that basic understanding. We got that command and control, the, C the CMTS controlling the modem. I also understand that there is an ideal level of transmit power that is optimal in order to avoid the noise floor and what to prevent the loss of channel bonding. My question is a bit more about how attenuation works and differs between return and downstream. It's taught from the beginning that attenuation is the loss of signal. So if a splitter is introduced into a cable system, let's say a two-way, then how would, how would you expect an average loss of 4 dB across the spectrum on the downstream? However, with return path, if you add said splitter, the transmit power that was sitting at 40 dBmV is now measured at 44 dBmV. Using an SLM, a signal level meter, why does the transmit power increase rather than decrease like the downstream? Why is the, what is the technical theory behind this change? So I think that's, I think John, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting that, um, you know, we, we have, this is a pretty common question and that interesting understanding is what we want to talk about today. And we'll have some plant diagrams that I, I think we can talk about here, how, you know, fundamentals we, we really want to talk about and, and communicate in this presentation. I think, I think the, uh, the issue lies in not understanding long loop level control and how CMTS, even in the first statement, 
the, the person here mentions that I understand the CMTS controls this the cable modem transmit levels. And that's what it is. It's there's a long loop level control between the cable modem and CMTS. Every uh, 15 to 20 seconds, the CMTS cable modem are talking to each other, trying to keep what we call keep alive or station maintenance to keep levels, upstream MER, upstream pre-equalization, um, certain, certain uh, aspects of the upstream in line. The CMTS by default wants to see zero dBmB plus or minus one. If those levels change at the CMTS, it's gonna tell the modem on its next station maintenance opportunity to change its level. So it is true that if you put attenuation in, the levels will go down. So, and they do. So if I put four dB of loss or splitter in line, my modem levels at the CMTS are gonna drop by 4 dB. But in turn, the CMTS is gonna see that and tell the modem to turn its levels up 4 dB to reach back at zero again. So that long loop level control, you know, between upstream, downstream, and back around again, uh, is trying to keep a nice level set. That way I can compensate for temperature changes, I can compensate for customers changing pads, EQs, uh, aging of equipment. Uh, so ultimately, we want zero dBmV at the CMTS plus or minus one. Uh, there are some exceptions to that rule. That could be what if the modem is maxed out in power and can't transmit any higher? Well, if that's the case, the CMTS might have its own little window to say, hey, I want you at zero plus or minus one, but you're hitting me at minus two. Okay, I'll let you stand. Uh, if my MER is so bad that it won't work, then it would go offline or go into upstream partial mode. So there's a lot of parameters there. And I think the basics here are, yes, attenuation will make levels drop, whether it's upstream or downstream. But on the upstream, the CMTS sees that drop and tells the modems to increase its level. So I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, John. It's this, it, that the CMTS transmit power is controlled by the cable modem transmit power is controlled by the CMTS, but I'm still kind of struggling here because you know what I see in a downstream is when I what I when I go through a two-way splitter, the power gets reduced. So you know on one side of the splitter it might be 40 dBmV and the splitter has 4 dB of loss. So on the other side of the splitter it's going to be 36 dBmV. So I kind of expect that same thing to happen on the upstream. Like when you go through a splitter, you should get loss. And that's what I think is, is confusing um, the person who asked this question is what's yeah. confusing me. So um, let's we have a diagram here. Maybe we can talk about that in the diagram and, and sort of go through that in a little bit more detail. So if we, if we look at this splitter that we have, so we have a two-way splitter here on the return path going into a CMTS, or our cable modem's right way down here. Um, at, so you mentioned the CMTS wants to have zero dBmV, right? That's, that's what we want to have at the CMTS. So why is it that the, you know, before the splitter, why, why would we not ha have less power before the splitter and then more power after the splitter? When you insert, I mean, really, we're looking at the modem transmit level, what the modem is saying it's transmitting. Uh, if you put a two-way splitter in any part of the path at all, between the cable modem CMTS, doesn't really matter where you do the testing, it's going to change by 4 dB because of the long loop level control. That means if I put a whether I test it before the splitter or after the splitter, it's more of a before and after I inserted loss. Like before you insert the loss, the modem might say I'm transmitting 35. After you insert the loss, the modem's going to say I'm transmitting, uh, you know, 39 because it had to overcome the 4 dB from the splitter. The CMTS sees that, tells the modems the jacket's levels up by 4 dB. So... Um, I guess it really depends also on where you're testing that level. Like, for instance, I've seen people hook up, say, return path monitoring equipment, but then their test point was either before or after that break point or wherever that was broken off. So I could make changes right in front of the CMTS that wouldn't may or may not affect the return path monitoring. That you really need to say, all right, 
If I know I'm going to put extra loss in line, like go back to your pitcher. What if you were on the that two-way splitter going into upstream zero and one? And and it was really a four-way splitter, and you fed some return path monitoring equipment. Something down, you know, something yeah, below down, where yeah, the CMPS is. Down there. Right. Like if I put more loss right on upstream zero and one port, the CMTS port, you're going to see a change in the modem transit level. The CMTS is still going to say zero because that's what it wants to see. Mm -hmm. But then the spectrum analyzer you have hooked up wasn't in line with that pad you put in. And it's going to see 40 be higher. Okay. You know, it, it's you really need to understand, I think, the long loop level control. And say, all right, if I put loss in at this one point, what other points in my network are going to see either higher or lower uh, based on what the cable modem and CMTS have to reset for? Right. It's, it's, it can be a little confusing. And I, and I understand that. Like, oh, man, I want this modem to have better MER. How can I get the modem to transmit a hotter level? Well, let's take out some padding. That's actually the opposite. If you take padding out, the CMTS sees a higher level. The CMTS will tell the modem to turn its levels down. Well, and so, we yeah, kind of see that example back here with the 40 dB pad, right? If um, there's a 40 dB pad inserted here, and before the 40 or after the 40 dB pad, the cable modem is transmitting at 44.5 dB MV. After the 40 dB pad, our, our transmit level is down to 4.5 dB MV. So if we're thinking about that, if we were to move this cable modem on the other side of this pad, the cable modem would have a transmit level of 4.5 dB MV. Now, I mean, really a cable modem can't transmit as low as 4.5 dB MV, but that's essentially what this diagram is showing. Yeah, the and, and the pad, is affecting in that case is on the common side of the diplex motor, so it's affecting the upstream and downstream. Um, sometimes I can look at modem downstream levels and upstream levels and determine if there's a lot of flat loss or a lot of coax loss. For instance, if I know my DOCSIS channels are up near 800 megahertz and I know the nonlinear nature of coax cable, where there's more loss at higher frequencies than lower frequencies. Uh, if I had a long drop line of RG6, RG59, RG11, whatever, uh, the downstream levels could be really low because of the nature of higher loss at higher frequencies. But the upstream frequencies are really low, you know, 5 to 42, 5 to 85 megahertz. And maybe those levels are low as well because it's going through coax that has low loss. Now, if, if I was off of a flat loss pad, tap, anything that was flatless, not, not non-linear like coax, then I could foresee where uh, if it was a high value tap, then the downstream levels could be low and the upstream levels could be high because the upstream has to overcome that high loss. So, and, and why is it that the, the downstream has more loss than the upstream? Because of that non-linear nature of coax. You know, it's, we, we've, you look at some of your diagrams and you see some of the tap values you have in this diagram. Uh, maybe it was like the second or third slide. You the had. next one. Yeah. And we designed our cable plants based on downstream because downstream was our, I used to say cash cow. We made money on downstream video <laughs> and now not so much. We're making more money on high speed data upstream and downstream. And a lot of people going over the top video anyway. So um, the design and architecture of most cable plants has been, Hybrid fiber coax, hybrid meaning mix. You run fiber as far as you can, and then you run coax because it's cheap. Amplifiers aren't that expensive. Taps aren't that expensive. And you have coax already in the plant. So you try to milk this cow as long as possible, which is what we've been doing for 10, 20, 30 years. And uh, we keep redesigning it. We redo docs to keep working on this HFC plant. But the tap values are based usually for downstream. And because the taps are flat loss, like, a 20 dB tap means there's 20 dB of loss from 5 to 1 gig, 5 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. It's not perfectly, you know, 20 dB of loss, but it might be 19.5 at 5 megahertz, and it, it could be 21 dB of loss at 1 gigahertz. We know they're not perfect, right? Yep. But that value of the tap is how much loss it's supposed to be going through the spigot of the tap. Now, if we could make a tap that was opposite of the coax before it, 
like nonlinear the other way, then we would be better suited for upstream and downstream levels. Right. And that's where we get into what we call flexible solution taps, where now the tap isn't just a flat loss tap. There could be extra attenuation just for upstream, or there could be an equalizer or cable simulator in that tap. So instead of the tap being flat loss across the whole band, five to one gigahertz, or even five megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz, it might be a tap that has a tilted loss or the other way. And is that tap just like any other tap? It would look like any other tap. The faceplate would look the same. The spigots look the same. But there might be some designation on there that says EQ20, EQ15. And then you look at the specification, it'll tell you, yes, this tap is rated at 20 dB at 1.2 gigahertz, but maybe it's actually 26 dB at 5 megahertz. It purposely has more loss at the low end because it's trying to make up for the coax nonlinear loss before it. When I say before it, I'm on the downstream side. Um, it'd be after it for the upstream side. So, so when we look at a, a diagram of an amplifier and the first tap is your highest value tap, when you go further away, you have lower value taps. And those lower value taps seem like non-intuitive, meaning I understand the lower value taps because of downstream levels. So I need to put a lower value tap so I can still have certain downstream levels to my house, my TV sets. But that modem transmitting on a low value tap doesn't have as much attenuation to overcome. So that modem doesn't transmit right. as hot Hello, as a everybody. modem that's on the first tap. Okay. So a modem that's closer to an amplifier is transmitting hotter than a modem that's farther away, which seems non-intuitive. Yeah, and this is where you're really starting to lose me. So let me let me go to this the, the next question couple of questions that I have here um, that I uh, maybe will bring some more context to this. So at Crimson King writes, why is the return always higher than the value of the tap? You know, maybe as, by as much as plus 20 dB. Um, it, it, this really deserves, uh, you know, he wants some more explanation by this. Um, and then at Zimbabwe, Steve followed up with that. Uh, um, that's actually a good question, as I know Cisco specifies amps to run out at 43 over 32 with a 20, D, 20 return, but why is this design specification? So um, we have a diagram here that starts to go into some of what you're talking about, John. And on the left-hand side of the diagram is an amplifier. There's a, um, there's a square box with a 26 in it, followed by another square box with a 23 in it, followed by another square box with a 17, a two-way splitter. And that two-way splitter goes off to two different boxes with 17s in it. And, and this is where, like, you know, as, as a new tech, I'm just, I'm so confused by this diagram here. And I'd, I'd like you to help walk me through this and explain w what these values in the boxes are why they're chosen and and how this you know how this all comes about what these values mean um, because like you were saying what one thing that I don't understand is 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 modems that are for you know what it's kind of showing is modems that are further away from the amplifier and the CMTS actually have a lower transmit value upstream transmit power value than modems that are closer to the CMTS and and that, like you said, is very counterintuitive because I would assume modems that are further away from the CMTS would have to transmit at a much higher power because they have more coax. They have a much further distance to transmit through. And, and there is, this is RF 101, right? Coax loss, nonlinear coax loss. The fact that lower frequencies have less loss. I mean, that's a good thing, right? We don't want loss, but the higher in frequency we go for downstream, the more loss we have, so we need more amplification, or we need more less loss by changing the tap spigots or the tap, the tap value. Even those tap diagrams are indicative of how many ports are on it. A square means there's four ports. Uh, a circle diagram would be two port tap. A, and this is a weird one, right? A, a, a hexagon is actually an eight port tap. You think it'd be an octagon, <laughs> but technically, I think in in low low data and and focus and all those other software uh, uh, applications, it's a hexagon, right. and it means it's an eight port tap. Um, the, the amplifier you have drawn shows a reverse in there, so it's active reverse, uh, and then you're just showing the levels, right? But those taps, that value in that diagram is showing the value of the tap, and 
uh, historically, they were all flat loss, meaning that's the loss across the whole band of whatever band that thing was specified for. Might have been five to one gigahertz, might be now five megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz. I've even seen old taps that said five megahertz, but they actually cut off about 10 megahertz. I kind of looked at that one as like a, uh, a blessing in disguise. <laughs> it was almost like the tap had a built-in filter, and I didn't want to use below 10 megahertz anyway. So to be able to filter that crap out from the house was actually a good thing. Because there's lots you know? of noise, typically yeah. below 10 or even 20 megahertz. Yeah. You get just, just so noise. much noise. Yeah. So you're saying because it didn't go below 10, you can kind of filter yeah. that noise out. Yeah. The bad thing was if you're trying to balance and you had roll off, then your balancing would be screwed up. Uh, you know, if you're doing a reverse sweep right from the house and you went to the tap and you saw like this low end roll off, right. then you'd be like, oh, I need to balance out that somehow. And, and no, you don't want to balance off a roll off. We balance off for the, the, the tilt and the amplifiers in the coax. We don't try to balance off for imp impairments, yep. you know, <laughs> like roll off and stuff like that. Um, but the fact that I had that little bit of roll off, it means I was filtering out that noise. I didn't have to worry about it. But I also know there was some systems at telemetry at like 5.8 megahertz or 6 or 7 megahertz for old set-top boxes. So <laughs> that would be a, could be a problem. Yeah. Okay, so, so going back to the diagram we are talking about. So these are taps. They're 26. It's a 26-value tap. Is, is that what, what that means, the 26 in there? Yes, the and, and you know, nowadays, and this has been happening for the last 10, 15 years, that first tap has dropped from a 29 to a 26 to a 23 because the 26 is even too much loss for the downstream when you're trying to feed a certain level to the, the, the modem and the TV sets and set-top boxes on the downstream. You know, the rule of thumb there was we wanted a TV set with zero. But by the time you go through drop line at higher frequencies, by the time you go through your splitter or demarcation point at the side of the house, and then more coax in the house, you got, you could be at minus 5, minus 10 at the TV set. Right. So a lot of designs you might see where they've changed the first tap to a 23, and the second tap is still a 23. So you might see like a 23, 23, 20, 17, 14, 8, 11, whatever. Uh, so there's always specifications for what levels do I need out of this tap, and they run all the numbers, and it's all right, well, this four-port 26 dB tap is going to give me this level out of the tap itself. But because of the four ports and the 26 dB loss, there's going to be through loss through that tap before I hit the next tap. And, what, and how much coax do I have? And how much typically is that through loss? It's all going to be dependent on how many spigots. Like if you took a four port tap, to make four ports, you have to have two levels of splitters, like a splitter feeding two other splitters to make four ports. That's how a tap fundamentally is made. So two levels of splitters would be about seven or eight dB loss right there just to make the four ports. Mm -hmm. So to have a 26 dB tap, you know the directional coupler feeding those two levels of splitters would be 26 minus eight would be uh, – a DC 16 or something like that. Right. Is that right? 26 minus eight, a DC 18 or whatever it would be. The higher the value of the directional coupler that feeds the through leg of the, the tap, the higher the value of the tap leg, the less the through loss. So, you know, a 26 dB four port tap might only have 0.75 to 1 dB of through loss. So that the Not loss going all. through the tap is really small. Yeah. Around. So you wrote down 0.5 dB, right? Yep. Yep. But look what happens when you get to – well, and I, I don't know that I agree with your four-port 17 because your four-port 17 would be a DC9, and I suspect the through loss on a four-port 17 is going to be more like one, uh, might be one and a half, uh, and it really depends on what frequency we're talking about. So it's not be a little really higher. Perfect. Yeah. And then if we went to a four-port 11 – now we're really, what we're doing is we're making a splitter, feed a splitter, feed two splitters to make four ports. A splitter is going to have four dB of loss. So if you had a four port, 11 dB tap, that would be almost four dB of through loss. Right. So, so, so the value that's in, so we're talking about that's how much loss is going through. How much loss is going on the down leg through the drop to the modem? And taps. that would be the value of the tap. That's the whole point, right? The value of that tap should be 26 dB of loss. So if I have downstream levels coming out of 42 
and I lose 26 from the tap, then I would have, what, uh, 18 coming out of the tap spigot. And then that 18 would have to feed the drop cable, feed the splitter in the house, feed the set-top box, and hopefully it's at a plus five, maybe a, a zero, minus five. I like minus five to plus five. I think that's a safe bet for levels. Right. So if I have a if I have a cable modem, then that you know I'm showing this modem is transmitting at 42. But let's say this modem was transmitting at, you know, uh, too too low of a value or too high of a value. Why why can't I just replace my tap then to get my modem transmitting at the values that I want it to be? And and that's a that's a good question because people technicians might think, oh well, I don't have the right level, so let me just change the tap base plate. The tap itself is hard lined in, it's heat shrunk, but the faceplate comes off and you just change the value. Yeah, two screws, I'm good to go, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's something you definitely don't want to do. The, the value of the tap was selected for a reason. It's all part of the design, the master design. <laughs> uh, so if you just change it willy-nilly, uh, you're going to affect the through leg, and now it's going to affect everyone downstream of that point. Oh, because I'm going to be changing this loss on this this through yes. loss is what you're saying, right? If I just yeah. if I just arbitrarily change this from a 23 to a, a different value, now that's going to impact sure. subscribers downstream. So now all these other modem levels are going to be changed just because I changed this tap here. Yeah, if you told me you had the 23 tap and you do all the math and it doesn't look right, well, maybe I changed the 23 tap to another 23 tap. Maybe the 23 tap was bad. Maybe it was uh, corroded. And maybe I just need a different base plate that's cleaner, and, but it's still the same value, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing could be if my levels aren't correct, maybe part of the design, they didn't think the drop line was going to be 300 foot long. So maybe instead of RG59, I have to run RG11 that has less loss to the house. So, so I'm not going to mess around with the tap base plate because that's going to affect everyone else downstream. Well, then how are all these tap face, I mean, how are all these values initially? calculated and computed so usually in a design it would say here's my my range of of levels i need to see on the downstream and that will dictate the value of the tap like it's not going to be i need to see 15 dbmv at every frequency coming out of my tap it's going to be i need uh, anywhere between uh, uh 12 and 20. So depending on how much coax go, you go through, you might say, all right, well, because I went through a lot of coax, I have more loss in the high end. I need a lower value tap. I come out of my amplifier with downstream tilted signals, uh, positive tilted signals. But as I go through coax, it starts doing this and diving on the higher frequencies. So at that last tap, I might still be able to get 12 dBmV out of it if I put 11 dB tap in. And if I put 11 dB tap in, it might put out 12 dB at 1 gigahertz, but it might be putting out 23 dB at, at uh, 5 megahertz or 54 megahertz, whatever the lowest downstream frequency is, you know, channel 2, 55.25, if, okay. if you still have a channel 2. <laughs> yeah, you probably, probably don't. <laughs> depends. It depends on the system. Yeah. Um, okay, so then we have um, down here at 32 point, we have this modem down here, which is actually a modem in the house. It's transmitting at uh, too low of a value because, you know, uh, you've told me we want our modems to be transmitting between 40 and 50 dBmV. So what do I do in this scenario then? Because you told me I can't just arbitrarily change my tap faceplate, or can so I? Let, let, me, let me give you, this is 20 years, 21, 22 years at Cisco. And then years with uh, WaveTech, Wando Golderman, Viavi, uh, Acterna, and then years with Secret Electronics. Uh, so I've been in the business for quite a while. And uh, knowing how Doxus works and know what the power levels are, know where it's going with Doxus 3.0 and Doxus 4.0 and Doxus 3.1 and OFDMA and 204 megahertz upstream, I've always felt like 48 dBmV modem transit level would be perfect. That would give me a little bit of headroom before it maxes out. Uh, it would, and, and here's the fallacy. People think running a modem hotter gives it better MER. It doesn't? That's not entirely true. We're not running a modem hotter just to run it hotter. We're adding attenuation into the cable plant that will make the modem run hotter, but what is the attenuation really doing? So as my technician, you are my, my, my technician. Yes. What is that attenuation really doing? 
Well, Besides making the modem run hotter, what else is it doing? It should be attenuating signals. Not maybe just maybe even noise too. Exactly. If we're, if we're exactly. Lucky. That's what we're hoping. And what people don't put one and one together to make two is we call this thing noise funneling. Everything funnels back to that one point on the CMTS. Right. Most of your junk comes from the low value taps because they are low value taps and the low frequency and coax. So for noise in a house off a 26 tap, it'd have to overcome 26 dB. So it's not so bad. But noise in a house on a 11 dB tap only has to overcome 11 dB of the tap and maybe 5, 6 dB of coax loss at 30 megahertz. So what about so, homes off of a four value tap? So they're going to be worse. So any noise that comes from the house, which we know most of the noise is coming from the house, um, it's going to be worse off the low value taps. So how can we, we – there's two things here. We know the motors off the low value taps are transmitting low. But we also know they're the big contributors to the noise for everybody because that noise funnels back and everybody sees the same noise floor. So if I could make those low value taps appear to be higher value taps, but not for downstream frequencies, just for upstream frequencies, I get the modem transmit hotter. And the real advantage is I'm going to attenuate the noise from those houses. But how do you do that? So I could do uh, step attenuators. They make like these, these pads, pencil pads that screw on to the tap spigot. But I don't like them because you have to buy it with a frequency span in mind. Am so I doing 5 to 42? I don't know. Am I doing 5 to 85? Am I doing 5 to 204? If I do something like that where I have a 5 to 42 return step, step attenuator, what happens if I go to 85 megahertz? You just lost yeah, a bunch of money on those out. pads, too. Yeah. You've got to buy new you pads. change them all out again. Yeah. So I'd, I'd rather design the equalized tap that, yeah, it says 11 dB on the tap, and maybe it is 11 dB at 1.2 gigahertz, but maybe it's actually a 17 dB tap at 5 megahertz. It's actually not a flat loss tap. It's more loss at the low end on purpose, so that modem will transmit 6 dB hotter than it was before. Okay. And it's not just to transmit hotter, it's going to add 60 dB of loss to all the attenuation from that house. But what does it do in the downstream? Uh, nothing because you still have the same flat, well, you still have the 11 dB of loss at 1.2 gigahertz. And normally when your downstream levels are at that lower value tap, they're like this, but your downstream levels are actually going to get flatter, flattened out better because you have an EQ inside the tap. So it's going to help my downstream and it's yes. going to help my upstream. Yes. Yeah. So, so we, we, I know we are stuck with the architecture we have and we might be stuck with the taps and, and the coax we have. Um, so what is, what is the fix, right? You want to design your downstream levels plus, plus minus five would be perfect in my mind, plus minus five. Uh, the spec might say minus 15 to plus 15, but you don't want to be super high in level because then you cut, cause distortions inside the modem itself. Super low and level, you have low MER, and now you might not be able to run the higher modulation schemes of DOCSIS 3.1 because your MER is so low. Um, on the upstream, 40 to 50 is good. I like 45, 48. Uh, higher levels means I have more attenuation to help drive the noise floor down. That's what I. That's my ultimate goal. So go back to your diagram, and here's we talked about this last time. And let's say I want to use that step attenuator. And I can't just use a regular attenuator because it's going to mess up my downstream levels. And let's suppose at the house itself, the downstream levels are perfect, and I find a step attenuator that's um, 6 dB. And, and I'm like, I want to make the modem transmit hotter. What would happen if I put that attenuator on the modem itself? Like right, right in here inside the house. Yeah, right? right. Yeah, right on a modem spigot. Right on the modem F connector. Well, wouldn't wouldn't that attenuate my signal and my noise just just like I wanted, like we like what we talked? The question is, where's the noise coming from? Well, if the noise is coming from in in the house, like right at the back of the modem, it's going to attenuate them. It's going to attenuate it here. But you know, what, what the likelihood? What if, what if the noise is noise from getting up in here? at the modem? Yeah, the noise is going to get in at the ground block. It's going to get in on a drop right. line because the squirrel's chewing on it. It's going to get into that splitter. It's going to come in on the TV set. Yeah, so, so if putting I'm a pad right at the modem isn't going to do you any good. It's like saying, you're let's saying I'm not raise gonna... the levels up just to attenuate them again. 
I'm not going to attenuate any of the noise that's Correct. on this line is what you're telling me, right? So the best place to put the padding would be at the tap. Up here. Because then yes. I'm going to attenuate way, the noise. Any noise that comes in from the house, the drop line, the ground block, it gets attenuated before it gets into the hard line plant. I see. Well, why wouldn't I put the pad like maybe all the way up at this two-way splitter then? Because then, then I'm going to attenuate the noise that's, that's on the hard line as well. But now you have to have a two-way splitter that it's kind of like we sweep and balance our cable plant and we will talk about unity gain in a second. Uh, but now we're like, oh, I got to balance my passives. <laughs> uh, do I have to inject signal and balance my passive with pads and equalizers or how is that going to work? They don't make a two-way splitter with plug and accessories. Um, they make taps now that I could put an equalizer inside the tap and it would affect all the ports of the tap. And that is supposed to help my upstream and downstream levels and compensate for the coax between the two-way and that four port 17 dB pad. Okay. So you're saying if I if I put the pad up here, I'm gonna I'm gonna screw up like the balancing that's already occurred in between here. And I and I won't be, you know, I should really focus here where it's just gonna impact yeah. the signal and, to noise and, and, of the customer. Yeah, and hardline cable is, Yeah, and hardline cable is not as much of our concern. What's the rule of thumb? Five percent of our problems are from the hard line. 95% are from the tap drop to the, the home. Right. So yeah. this this is where you're saying this is where most of the noise is coming from. This drop, this really thin line and, and the subscriber's yep. home. Correct. And there's not going to be a lot of noise coming from the hard line in the main plant. Correct. That makes more sense now. Yeah, it's funny because when then when you start thinking about the noise floor, what happens is if you design more loss on the upstream on these low value taps, if you looked at a spectrum analyzer in the head end, all the modem levels just keep readjusting to hit the CMTS zero. So they don't change on the spectrum analyzer. But what you'll find when you start attenuating the noise floor from these low value taps, the noise floor in the head end will drop. So now everybody is getting a better MER. Right. Not just the modems with the low value taps. Okay. So, so you mentioned unity gain. So how do we, I mean, how do we get these levels set? And, Cause you said, I don't want to put a pad here cause that's going to mess up these levels. How is it that, you know, the cable modem signal can go from this modem all the way up to this amplifier and, and still be at the correct level when it gets to this amplifier? You know, when we, when we balance uh, downstream, uh, the ultimate goal is hitting the first hybrid inside of an amplifier with enough level to go get above its noise figure. And a lot of amplifier hybrids, you know, the actual electronics that amplify the signal, they have like a three, five, five dB noise figure. And the rule of thumb used to be you need to hit about like five dB above the noise figure to have a good clean CNR. Cause you crap in, crap out, right? <laughs> you, want, you want to have a good enough signal and high enough above that whatever contribution from the hybrid doesn't affect your overall MER too bad. Uh, so the lower that level hitting that first hybrid, the worse your CNR is. And then inside the amplifier, you have multiple hybrids. So the first hybrid or amplification device is more critical on CNR. We also call SNR or MER. Um, yeah. But once you bump the signal levels up, the second hybrid is going to see higher levels and it's more critical for distortions. So we all know proof of performance and our performance is dictated by composite second order, composite triple beat. Those things are now being combined into composite um, uh, CC, CCIN? Com Com C C it's composite composite intermodulation. intermodulation noise. Yeah, I forget <laughs> what the second C is. <laughs> composite intermodulation noise, whatever we call it. Yeah. But, but yeah. now that we have digital haystacks intermixing with each other, they're not coherent video channels mixing with each other. Right. If I took uh, three video channels mixed together, it would cause a coherent beat somewhere else. And we know where that falls for CSO and CTB. That's why it was called second order and third order, because it was two frequencies or it was three frequencies mixing. And what would now that look like? Chunks, what, would C what would CTB and CSO look like? So composite second orders take two frequencies and do a subtraction. Like if I take channel three at 60... 1.25 subtract 55.25 channel 2, you end up with 6 megahertz. 
that would be like CPD, common path distortion, right? Every six megahertz, because the downstream channels are six megahertz apart. You do all the frequencies, you add F1 plus minus F2 plus minus F3. That's composite triple B. It's frequencies adding or subtracting. Uh, composite triple B could also be two F1 minus F2, right? It could be uh, uh, a multiplication of one frequency and you subtract a third frequency and you end up with a beat somewhere else. So this is so with analog channels. These are like yes. the intermodulations that we get or yeah. the, the, the noise that we get basically created with analog channels intermodulating yeah, that's what together. All of our this RF 101 is, is why we have amplification, why we have certain spacing between the amplifiers, why we have certain levels. We have requirements to the end customer, but we also know there's fine line between noise and distortion. And now that the downstream levels aren't just video channels, they're big chunks of qualm channels, that could actually intermix together and make the whole noise floor look higher because they're not falling at individual beats like CSO and CTB did. Now CSO and CTB is really intermodulation noise. So you could have a whole noise floor that looks raised up and you say, oh, man, I must have a bad noise floor. When in reality, it might be you're running levels so high, you're causing intermodulation noise in the amplifiers, and that's causing the noise floor to rise up. So we know there's a fine line in, in performance and end of line uh, numbers of noise contribution, distortion contribution. Um, you know, we have our optical link contribution, which used to be our, our limiting factor. But now that we might be doing remote five, we get rid of the analog fiber and go digital fiber. It gets rid of all that problem, right? Which is kind of a good thing. So, so what uh, you're so, saying is, we it's a trade off, right? If in in the downstream, if we run our signals low, we don't have this intermodulation noise, but we have too much carrier to noise. Our our signals are too close to the noise floor. So intuitively, we think, well, let's just jack our signals up really, really high to a high level. But then that's going to overdrive the RF amplifiers, these hybrid devices that you've been talking about, and that's going to create intermodulation. If it's analog signals, we get these little beats, CTB, CSO beats. If it's digital signals or SC QAM signals or OFDM channels, then that's going to create our CCIN, which just looks like an elevated noise floor. So we're, yep. we're now we're back to our fighting a noise floor again with our, with our channels. Correct. Correct. So it's, it's, I, I find it funny when you talk about unity gain on downstream, we usually balance, we say constant outputs, like uh, the trunk amplifiers of certain outputs, the bridger distribution amps and line extenders of certain amplifiers. You might say your one example said 42 over 32. So that basically meant 42 dBmV coming out at uh, maybe 750 megahertz and 32 dBmV coming out at channel two at 55.25 megahertz. So you have a tilted level coming out of the amplifier and we usually balance the amplifiers for the same level all the way down the line, unity gain. But what's funny about it is you balance the amplifier by putting a pad and EQ in, and it's actually before that first hybrid. So even though you're balancing for an output, you're technically balancing for an input to that first hybrid. And this next slide, we, we, we kind of show that um, that sloped output that we're we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. So that at the top of the slide, we you know we we show coming out of a fiber node. The blue line is that sloped output that you're talking about where higher frequencies have higher power and lower frequencies have lower power. And then in between. Yeah, so, and, and you're showing the blue line coming tilted output. Then you're going through coax, which makes the tilt drop down the other way. And in reality, it's not even perfectly linear, right? It's it's uh, the old rule of thumb was F1 over F2 equals the square root of L1 over L2 um, for for loss versus frequency. So uh, coax doesn't have a no, linear loss. You're I saying it has a, it has a nonlinear loss? Or L1 over L2 equals the square root of F1 over F2. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but it's more like a bathtub. It's more like a, it's yeah. not perfectly linear tilted. It's a little bit of slope and a little bit of curvature to it. Yeah, it has a belly in the middle. The of the coax. But you get the idea. Right. So and I then, and then you balance for that same tilted output of the next amplifier, but the balancing accessories are technically before that first hybrid inside the amplifier. So in reality, like you're showing it, the red input being negative and you put the pad and EQ, it's going to make that a little bit flatter and uh, proper level right before the first hybrid inside that amplifier. We're not showing that part of it, right? Right. So... So basically, you're, you come out of the amplifier with a sloped output because the coax cable has 
the opposite response of that sloped output, that positive slope. Right. Coax has a negative slope, not linear with a belly. It's going to be curved. Mm -hmm. And then as you go into the amplifier, you your, the amplifier is going to correct for that. It's going to compensate for that. And the amplifier is going to give you positive gain again, for sloped output, to compensate for the coax loss. And it just repeats that cycle over and over again. And, and, and then, uh, so that was downstream. And in the upstream, you know, we we do unity gain usually there where we we don't have a constant signal in the upstream like we do the downstream. The downstream level is always there. And we can go check levels and balance it based on those levels. And once we work our way down the line, everything falls into place. On the upstream, we have to inject level. So we inject level, and then we look at uh, what's happening in the head end to make it make sure it's proper. But we still have to work our way from the head end out. We can't start at the end of the line, inject a level, and balance an amplifier for an input to the next amplifier. So Unless I don't, I don't just cool. inject a level here at the end of the line? Correct. Why not? Because because you don't know if the other amplifiers in front of it going back towards the head end are balanced or not. Okay, so I have to start I have to start back here at the fiber node and inject my yeah. level. And, yeah. and and typically what level do I start injecting there? Now here's here's the uh, the optical link if it's an analog optical link does have a fine uh, recommended level for proper OMI, optical modulation index. So that optical link is more critical in what will drive the entire network. Now, let's say we don't even have that optical link set up yet. The way we used to do it is we would take a sweep reference at the node and say, all right, this is my reference point, nice flat line. I don't even know what the levels are at this point. It's just a nice reference line. Uh, and I know that when I'm all said and done, I want... Any tap off of the amplifiers or any tap off the node, I'm, I'm assuming you kind of have a head end symbol there, but let's say that's the node, right? Mm -hmm. um, if there's a tap off there, you want any modem off that first tap, tap to really be transmitting the same level, like 48, 45 dBmB, something like that. If that's the case, then I might say, all right, 20 dBmB is my reference level. That's what I'm shooting for. Um, when I go to that first amplifier down the line, I'm going to inject that same level that I injected at the node, but I'm not going to see my sweep trace being at the zero mark because the sweep has to go all the way back through the amplifier, through the coax loss, and back to my reference point, which is my sweep receiver. Which and is now it end, might right? look like it might look like because I injected a flat signal, the signal at the head end might look like this. So that first amplifier, I have to put an equalizer in to flatten it out, and it might be at a plus five reference level, so I put a five dB pad to put it back to zero reference level. Now I know that my amplifier is exactly the same as what my reference was. So and this is like, this is like on, the very first step, the very first yeah. setup, making sure your amplifier and your node back to the head end is set up correctly. Correct. So when people say, oh, I'm, I'm designing for 17 across the board or 20 dBmV input across the board, I'm like, it's sort of apples to apples. If I designed and injected 10, 10, 10, 10, does that hurt me at all if I really wanted to do 15, 15, 15, 15? No, I still did the same relative level for balancing. What really dictates what happens in the real life is what I do at the CMTS and the upstream padding. So if I say, all right, I designed for uh, 20 dBmV input, uh, oh, that was wrong. I should have been designed for 17, 17, 17. I'm like, Change it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> I could go in the head end and take padding away or put padding in, and that will dictate what happens to the modems, and that's what will dictate what happens to the amplifiers. Right. So, and, and what would cause you to change that padding? Like what, why would, so if you, let's say you set it up at 20, but you wanted to change it to 17, why would you go into the head end and change that pad? Like we talked about at the beginning, it's to make the modems transmit hotter. Like I might say, um, I changed out my fiber node and now all the modems are transmitting six dB lower. So what happened? Well, maybe someone changed out the fiber node and there was a pad in the node and they forgot to put the pad back. 
So now you have so to get your levels, your, your modems are transmitting. Yeah. Maybe they, they didn't it, put it, that 6 dB pad back in. So now all of a sudden your modems are transmitting 6 dB lower. How did my, I like lost my, there we go. My back end? You're there. There we go. <laughs> and we I lost my John. audio. We're here with us. Check my audio. <laughs> See, um, now you lost your audio. <laughs> you killed it. How about this? No, there you go. You're good. Okay. Good. So, so uh, uh, if I changed out my node and I lost 6 dB padding, the CMTS would see 6 dB higher and then tell the modems to drop their levels by 6 dB. Now, now, why is that? Because I, you know, I thought if I took that 6 dB pad out, my modems would go down by 6 dB. So, and, and that's, and they did. But remember, I just said, if you change the node out and there was a pad there, but then you put a new node in with no pad. If you took, you basically took 6 dB padding out. Mm -hmm. The CMTS is going to see on the upstream 6 dB high. And then it's going to tell all the modems during the station maintenance period, drop all your levels by 6 dB to hit me back at zero. Okay. So we're right back to right back to the long loop level control. This where, goes yeah. back to Spectrum's 197 question about you know why when you put a splitter in, do the modem levels go the opposite way in the upstream as they do in the downstream? Yeah. So it, it's the the optical link is more critical on um, your optical modulation index, your channel loading, uh, your distortions. Uh, the optical link budget can affect your upstream MER. A lot of times the upstream MER is dictated by optical link more so than all the amplifiers combined. You could have, you know, the, the tree and branch architecture we do with HFC networks, you could have one node and easily 20 line extenders, five bridger amps, and three trunk amps. So you could have 25 active devices all feeding noise back to that node, and the node is still the limiting factor. So even if, you know, so... Even if I balance these amplifiers all at 20, 20, 20, you know, unity gain, everyone, and and you told me as, you know, you said, hey, Brady, you were supposed to balance these all at 17, 17, 17, I could still make up for this at the at the uh, fiber node just by changing a pad by 3 dB to exactly. make up for that offset. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Oh, so and then, cool. then it begs the question, is it better, like, let's say in the overall scheme of things, my modems are all transmit pretty low. I have some headroom and I want to, okay. So I, uh, it, so where were we? We're on the, uh, the node, right? Yeah. So I and, balanced the 20, 20, oh, 20, unity yeah, gain so, and return. So I might say, uh, I looked at all my modem transmit levels and I have some window that I could, uh, make them transmit hotter, get better MER across the board. I may be able to run higher OFDMA modulation schemes if I just run a little bit hotter for my modems. Uh, how do I do that? How do I make them run hotter? Well, I could put 3 dB padding in the head end. That would hit the CMTS lower. CMTS would say, all right, jack your levels up by 3 dB to make up for it, and now hit me at zero. So now all the modems level are hotter. They're hitting the upstream laser hotter, and here's where it gets sketchy. If it's an analog laser and you're hitting it with hotter levels, what's going to happen? Well, so I was just going to ask you this question, John, because you know I don't like leaving the head end very often because it's it's HVAC. It's a nice. I got a comfy sit chair there. So why don't I just throw a zero pad in the node and I'll do all my padding in the head end? So and 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 uh, and that's where if you do that, you're going to end up hitting the upstream laser with higher levels, which could cause noise from the laser itself. You know now you're going to have uh, laser clipping which, you know, uh, is from upstream levels, upstream noise. Uh, laser clipping is when you try to overdrive the, an analog laser. If it was a digital laser, we wouldn't have that issue, but we have a lot of analog lasers out there that have a, a, a uh, what do you call it, a OMI curve that goes up to a certain point. It's optimum, and then once you put too much level into it, RF level, it has more drive current, and then it starts coming down because of intermodulation noise. I've also so, seen this thing called an NPR curve. Yeah. Is that anything like the OMI anything. curve that you're talking about? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, there is a fine line and an optical link of how much level you can put in. More level, better CNR. More and more level, 
and then it starts dropping off because of intermodulation noise and laser clipping. So there's an optimal padding level for lasers, return path lasers that I, I want to put the correct pad in so I have the correct level coming into my return path transmitter to make yep. sure that I'm, I'm not too hot and, uh, and signal or I'm not too low in signal, otherwise I'm going to have issues. But and it's funny, as, as, as much as we want to optimize it and we have all the mathematics and all that, uh, RF is RF. <laughs> noise is RF. So all it takes is somebody with a CB or some type of electrical noise, and that could be even higher power level than all your signals combined. So too much ingress noise. will cause issues yeah. too, even if I have my padding correct yeah. at the fiber node. Yeah. I have all these people trying to optimize. Hey, John, I'm going from eight, from 42 to 85 megahertz. I'm going to double my spectrum. Should I derate my optical link by 3 dB to give myself more headroom? I'm like, in theory, yeah, but heck, you probably have ingress. It's already eaten up that headroom anyway. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's <laughs> a couple of dB here and there. Now, what sort of saves us on the upstream is the bursty nature of upstream. But the more we offer higher speeds, the more we allow upstream bonding, the more we fill up this upstream spectrum simultaneously. It's no more up, down, up, down. It could be all of it's up, and then all of it's down. And how, how does OFDMA, because you know we're starting now to deploy OFDMA, how does that impact an analog return path transmitter? I mean, it's going to be more spectrum, which means more power. Uh, we call it uh, composite, or TCP is what? Uh, total composite power. <laughs> Besides transmission control protocol, it's also called total composite power. So we're going to have more total composite power hitting our upstream lasers, which, you know, that's why I kept trying to be a proponent of digital fiber. Go remote fire, remote MACFI, get rid of the analog fiber, and you solve a lot of problems. Laser clipping is one of the biggest ones. Uh, if I want to run higher modulation schemes, I need better MER. To have better MER, I need to get rid of the laser clipping aspect of it, you know, and run higher levels. So, so I've seen like, you know, um, peop, I, I've, I've looked at remote shelves and versus remote phi. And then like a benefit of a remote shelf is you can still use your existing analog optics. Um, but kind of what I'm understanding from you is maybe that remote shelf may not be as optimal as a remote phi because with the remote shelf, I still have my return path transmitter and my forward path uh I, I, transmitter. I, I think this the space for a remote shelf would be more like say I'm Comcast and I just bought a Ma and Pa uh, system out in the middle of rural America and they have their own head end. I'm like, why would I keep their head end when I have my own head end? You could run I could fiber run and digital drop that fiber to their head end, rip everything out of their head end, and just put a remote by shelf in there, and then just. From that point, that hooks up to all their analog equipment out in the field. Right. So yeah, they still have their old HFC plant in the field, but I just was able to put a CMTS and all my head end equipment in a centrally located place in the remote place that used to be a small head end. I got rid of it completely. Which and is I just a shelf. Yep. Yeah. And that's the reason to use it. No, that makes a lot of sense. So John, I've, You've taught me a lot today. I've learned a lot, but I, I still think there's a lot more on this journey that we have to go down um, over time. And and the good news is, um, coming up this September 19th to 22nd is SCTE Expo, and that is a fantastic time um, if people can make it to attend, because there's going to be lots and lots of live sessions. Um, if we can get the slide up, a couple of sessions I want to recommend for people is uh, one, the plant maintenance session, um, what and how, plant maintenance 4.0, uh, on Tuesday, September 20th, uh, 2022, from 3.30 p.m. to 4.45, Ron Rannick will be pre pre presenting um, its combination of PNM and DOCSIS 4.0, and there's other people presenting in that session, of course. And then also uh, on Wednesday, September 21st, 2022, um, navigating the 10, D 10 g journey. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, five things about VCMTSs everyone should know about. And we'll be talking about things like, you know, uh, RFI and things like that and the VCMTSs. So definitely encourage everyone to take an opportunity to uh, come to Cable Tech Expo. It'll be in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Tons and tons of workshops to learn more about things like John and I were just talking about, as well as all kinds of new technology 
coming out. Um, I will be there. Um, hopefully, John, you'll be there. And um, and after the show, we'll also have uh, a, a to talk. Uh, we'll have a live stream to talk about what we learned at Cable Tech Expo. So really looking forward yeah. to the show and looking forward to seeing all of our viewers at the show as well. So it's always good to hear, you know, uh, uh, information from different people, from different ways of points of view. And uh, I'm glad Ron's going to be there. It'll be good to see him again, too. Absolutely. And I plan to be there. Yes. And hopefully he'll be wearing a nice long strip of ribbons as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, thanks for your time today. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in and watching. And we will be back. We'll see you hopefully at Cable Tech Expo. We'll be back after that. All right. All right. So long. Take care. See ya.